Welcome to the Steve Stein Guitar Podcast, brought to you by GuitarZoom.com. If you want to improve your guitar playing, keep listening. If you want to improve even faster, go to GuitarZoom.com, where you'll find all of Steve's premium courses, masterclasses, and memberships that'll help you quickly and easily improve your playing. Now, here's your host, Steve Stein. My name is Steve Stein. This is the Steve Stein Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. I have one of the absolute best people in the entire world on with me. His name is Mr. Steve Grimmett from Grim Reaper fame and just an overall wonderful, good looking man. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> I'm doing good. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really good introduction. <laughs> you should have more like that. Yeah, I'll pay the money directly into your account. <laughs> Cool. Very cool. Well, Steve and I go back a long way, and I thought it'd be fun to hear some stories that I don't get to hear from Steve about the early days and things that he did, what got him into music and all that sort of thing. I think about how much time we've spent together and how much time we've talked, and I don't know that I really know a lot about your past, your early days of getting started in the business and your influences, and I thought it'd be really fun to talk about some of that stuff because I would love to know about it as well. Well, it goes back a long way, actually. I think I was maybe 15, I think. So it was kind of late starting. I mean, I used to sing for mum and dad, you know, in the pubs and stuff like that. And I'm not going to tell you what I used to <laughs> sing. But um, to say the band uh, came from Utah, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I sort of fell into rock, really. I used to listen to a lot of uh, pop stuff. And my favourite band at the time was Slade. And a huge fan of them, still am. But a girlfriend caught me singing in the bedroom and she said, oh, you're really good. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. And it was for some unknown reason, she got me a job or got me a audition for a, a band in Cheltenham. I was living in Tewkesbury, so that was like, you know, 15 miles away. And I went and I got the job. And that's where it all started, really. And it wasn't too long. We had a, I think I joined them to do two or three songs over here. The ABC cinemas used to have a Saturday morning minors show. So it was all the young kids going watch cartoons <laughs> and all that sort of thing. And we ended up playing at this thing. And that was the only gig I did with her because the guitarist actually used to do the singing. And he felt a bit put out the fact that he wasn't singing anymore. He's just playing guitar. So it lasted one show. And then, oh, I got to, can't remember how it all happened, but. I then was living in Evesham, which is, a, again, a town about 15 miles away. And they got a really healthy music scene. They still have. And basically, I got into joining bands. Joined, the first one was a, was a Crater Mass. How old were you at this point? I was about 17, I think, died then. And, yeah, I suppose it was progressive rock, I suppose. And then I had... A call, well, not a call, but I spoke to a guy called, oh, I've forgotten his name. How does that happen? Old, yes, you're getting old. <laughs> That's how that happens. <laughs> yeah, it was Lance Perkins, and he came to me. I want to form a band. And I said, yeah, okay, cool, okay, let's do it. And he was a pretty cool guitarist, and he's now a guitar repairer for the rock stars over here. He's got a shop where he sells guitars and amps and all that sort of stuff. But he does a lot of work for Tony Iommi and guys like that. And he's a great guitarist as well. And so we formed a band uh, called Medusa, and that's where it all started, really. We started to have record labels come to see us and all that sort of thing, although we never got signed. That was the start of it. That's where I got my passion from, really, I suppose. So with that band, how long were you in that band? And are you still friends with anybody from that band? Yeah, I'm still friends with all of the guys, actually. There's only a few bands I've been in where I'm not uh, friendly with the guys. I still speak to Lance, the guitarist, Eddie, the uh, drummer, the bass player. I don't. Yeah, I do. I speak to him on Facebook, but I still am good friends with them. And they're good guys. And I think at the end of the day, when you play with good guys, you never fall out with right. them. I agree with that. Yeah, you just end up going your own musical way that's what happened to the drummer and Lance the guitarist from uh, Medusa they went on and formed Wrathchild the glam band they did it 
So they did that. And then I was like, okay, so I've got nothing to do, blah, blah, blah. And then Nick Bocock phoned me up, absolutely off his trolley, which means <laughs> drunk in this country, or what another word for drunk. And he was like, just chatting to me. And then I was like, what did you phone me for? Anyway, next day he phones up. He said, I'm oh, sorry about that chap. He said, I was absolutely drunk off my face. And what I really meant to tell you, ask you was join Grim Reaper. And I was like, yeah, I will. Because <laughs> at the time I said to my dad, that's a band I would love to join because I think they're great. They, they do harmonies, which we didn't do in Medusa and all that sort of thing. So we got together and we made some really stunning stuff, I think. And the rest of that really is history, you know, and that's my history in a very brief, in a brief moment. But no, it's not. It was a lot longer than that, barely. But yeah, I've had some great times and I've had some upsetting times. And I think, well, I don't know, but I do love it. What's interesting, first of all, our meeting was a very chance meeting, but it was also very interesting because when I was a kid and I was learning how to play guitar, because I lived in a small town in North Dakota, there were a few guitar teachers around, but there just wasn't a lot. And so once I learned how to develop my ear, I would put on an album, and yes, they were records back then, and then I would put the needle on it, and I would sit and listen to it for five seconds, and I would rewind it over, pick the needle up and do it over and over and over again. And then I would go to my guitar and try and figure it out. And I would do that with like High and Dry by Def Leppard was a big one for me. Blizzard of Oz was a big one for me. Back in Black was a big one, but See You in Hell was a big one. So it was always interesting to me because that album was huge for me as this American kid in a small Midwestern city, just huge into See You in Hell, that album. And I was sitting there learning all of these riffs, listening to this stuff. And like I said, it's just interesting how you and I wound up meeting. You came to a show that I was playing at one night. You were in Fargo. And then you and I started talking and I had mentioned to you that I was getting married in Scotland <laughs> and you became the best man at my wedding and this history from there. But yeah, it's just interesting. But oh, there's a couple of things I want to talk about before I get to that. But before you started playing in bands, like in the early days of the bands, I'm assuming most of the stuff that you guys did was original, right? Yes. Yeah, we did a few covers, but that was really more for ourselves, Neon Knights and stuff like that. But there would only be one in the set. And we've always done that. We've always had, well, not always, but mostly we've had and done a cover in every set. So in England at that time, was that kind of the norm, was to play original material? Most of the bands at that time were playing originals? Yes, it was. Because and used a cover version. So people recognize the song. It's like, oh, yeah, I can do. Yeah, OK, well, I'll get into the rest of their songs. It was a way of getting people into your songs. And that's why we did. And everybody did that. And obviously you just played your favorite band. Nick was into Black Sabbath and that was it. But a lot more as well. Because yeah, actually when I was in Medusa, we did a Judas Priest cover, Starbreaker. And that was my introduction into singing high. Because I was like, oh, I'm never going to be able to sing that high. But when I was listening to it, because Lance was into Judas Priest, and I just opened my mouth and it came out. And I was like, oh, right, okay, I can do that. I didn't think anything of it. And then the more and more bands came out, the more and more screaming they were doing. I thought, well, I'm not doing any of that, not following that. And I, I haven't really, but I can still get up there. I did a Three Tremors tour of Europe because Harry Cronklin couldn't make it. And that really extended my range. Well, no, I had to use my extended range in that one just to keep up with uh, Sean Peck and Tim Ripper Owens. That was great. I really yeah, enjoyed Yeah, it is so cool that you were able to be on that because I always followed what they do too. So that's something else too for people that know Steve, obviously know his history. What I find interesting is like I remember us being on tour together and people would ask you, well, what do you do for warm-ups? And you're like, well, usually it requires a shot and something else. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're not really a warm-up. And again, I'm not saying that I know for sure. That's why I'm asking about it. But did you ever really do much for your vocal range or was it just a natural thing? Because the unique thing about Steve is if you listen to Steve when he sings high, you don't hear this falsetto thing that a lot of singers do. There's like a full, it's full all the way to the top and there's power there. Yeah, I couldn't do falsetto. I don't know. I can, that's rubbish. I can do falsetto, but it really sounds like it. 
So what you hear me going up there is a natural voice. It's my range. I don't know how I do it. I don't warm up. I never have done. You know, like you say, it's normally a beer or a shot. And um, and some people say, well, your voice isn't going to last like that. Well, I'm sorry, but there are no rules. And I don't warm up. I don't think I'm lazy in that respect, but it just, I don't. And whichever way I lost my voice, I, I tore my vocal cords or back in the early 90s and had to have an operation. And afterwards, I had to see a uh, vocal coach. And she says, right, OK, sing for me and let's see what you do. And I started to sing for her. And she said, well, nothing I can teach you there, is there? And I was like, oh, hang on a second. What about warming up? She said, well, if you if you must. But she didn't even encourage it. But I did. I did actually warm up after that because in my head, every time I opened my voice up, I was thinking, I'm going to do it again. And that was a no-no for me. So I did use to warm up, but it wasn't for very long because it got boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing I always thought about you too, is that when we've done shows or we do recordings or whatever, and here's the thing. I remember, I'm just going to tell this quick story because Steve and I still sort of have a band called Grimstein that we did together. And it was, again, shortly after we met and then started hanging out, I started sending some audio to Steve to sing over. And I remember the first thing, because you have to understand that I grew up playing in bands and most of the bands that I played in were cover bands because that's what you did around here. And you make money and you play for three hours and you go away for the weekend with your buddies and it's just a, a fun time. And so when I started writing, I started sending stuff over to Steve over in England. And I remember the first thing I sent you, Steve goes, you know, I really like it, but there's really nowhere for me to sing because there's like 14 guitar parts going on. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do. <laughs> That's when I first started learning to back off and leave space for Steve to be able to do his thing. But I'm not just saying this because you're my friend and I'm just not just saying this because we're on this podcast, but there is something absolutely magical about the way you write and the way you sing because I would send something over and then I would just get all excited waiting for it to come back because when it came back, it was a song. When I sent it to you, it was an idea. It was a structure, what I call a bed. It was a bed. But when I got it back from you, it was like it became a song. And there's an immense amount of talent in being able to do that, to be able to write a hook and a melody. And I've just always been amazed at your ability of being able to do that. When you on an average, and I know this might not be easy to answer, but on an average, when you sit down to write, like if I sent you something, how long does it take you to come up with the general idea of what you're going to be doing with this? I'll pretty much know the first time I listen to it and where I start is with the chorus. And once I've got the chorus and the idea, the story behind the chorus, I'm away. That'll take me best part of a day, two days, and that'll be done. Yeah, I've got one. I've got a guy. Do you know what? I'm not sure where he's from in the world. He sent me a song and it was like having like the second or third song from you. What? This is great. And I came up with a chorus and da, 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 da. And then I had computer problems. <laughs> I've only just got my computer back. So and he's obviously excited and waiting for it as well. But it is that way around. And, and I've got to say as well, yeah, I mean, you guys know that I lost my leg just four years ago. And... That really affected me in a big way. I got PTSD and then I lost my brother and that all the grief and all the rest of it really put me in a bad place. And mentally, not physically, but mentally put me in a bad place. And I lost the ability to write. And it's only just well, now, really, that I've been able to pick up where I was. And that's such a sad thing. And, and it's a horrible thing to sit down to a piece of music and not and just go blank that's really horrible but i have that back now so yeah it's good yeah it's, it's made me feel it's pulled me out or started to pull me out of the dark place i was in well and that's one thing i was going to say too is when you write does the topic generally come up first or is it a, a pitch thing like a melody or is it a rhythmic thing like what tends to kind of and it might be all of those things but like i said i'm not just saying this because you're my friend i think you do an amazing job of coming up with really catchy choruses. And then there's always a really interesting, like there's a song we haven't released yet called Apparition, which I love. Anyway, so when you're writing, 
how does that work in your mind? It's funny, actually, because a lot of the songs that I've written with you come from watching TV, actually. It's like uh, Call 911. I watched the movie with Nicolas Cage in it. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I think it was, I'd recently got the song from you. I was like, yeah, that's it. And I was in the studio. And To Catch a Killer, that was oh, John Wayne Gacy. Is that Casey or Gacy? Yeah. And like all those things were apparition was, that was a TV series in the UK by Martin Shaw. And he was a priest. And it was all about demonization of his parishion and all that sort of thing. And he would go out there and exercise and do all that sort of stuff. And that's where that came from. It can, I don't know, it could be anything that just triggers it off. And for me, then it comes sometimes, like you say, it's all of those things. It's all of the melody, the idea and the hook in the chorus. And that's where I start. And then the rest of it, it's not comes easy, but it, well, it kind of does. And it follows on from the chorus because the chorus is the main thing. It's the thing that everybody remembers. So you just do that and you add to that to build it up to the chorus. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love it. You know, I remember, (laughs) I don't know how long it was. Well, it had been a few years before I met you that I met my wife. But I remember when I would get those songs and then she started getting excited too. So like we would both sit around and just keep checking emails, waiting for something to come in to see the, the transformation of those. And the reason I'm saying that is because obviously, as I mentioned, Steve was the best man at my wedding. And then years later, Jess and I had a daughter, Imogen, which Steve is the godfather of. But I remember wanting to write a song when I was in the hospital with, her name is Imogen, we call her Emmy. When I was in the hospital with her, right after she was born, I was recording the sound she was making because she couldn't cry yet. So all she could do was make these cooing sounds, these little sounds, she couldn't fully cry. And so I started recording these whenever I'd see her, I'd record these sounds. And then I went to Steve and I was like, look, I really want to write a song for Emmy. And so the last song on the album that we did is Emmy's song, the, To Sing a Lullaby. So if you listen to it at the beginning, you hear those little coos and you hear her first cry. When she first started learning how to cry, I recorded that and you hear that at the end of the song. But the point is when we were listening to the song, we got it back from Steve. My wife and I could not listen to that song for about four months without bawling. We'd cry every time we listened to that song because it was so perfect. And oh my gosh, Evie, now she just does this whenever we play it. Like she doesn't want to hear it. I'm like, you don't even understand how much emotion was in this thing when this thing was written. It was insane. It was, I'll tell you now, I'd never actually put pen to paper when I wrote the lyrics for that. It was all recorded as press record and went for it. All these things in my mind were coming out and the lyrics were just going down into the computer and everything. And then when I listened to it back, I was like, what have I done? And I started bawling. <laughs> and then I think I'd got the day off and Amelia, my wife, she came back from work and, and I said, listen to this. And I started bawling before I even pressed play. And it was a beautiful thing. It really was. And I will never, ever forget doing that song. It was a really special moment. And I don't know where the lyrics came from. They just did. And it was perfect. Yeah, it's interesting. There are a million memories of things that I enjoy. But as far as recorded music goes, there'll never be a song as important and as magical as that song was for me. It was just unbelievable. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far and you're getting motivated to take your guitar playing to the next level. Please do me a favor and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It'll help the show grow and reach more rock stars like you who want to improve their guitar playing. Also, I'd love to know what parts of the episode you liked as well as what you learned. So please share this podcast and tag us at guitarzoom.com on your social post. And now let's get back to the podcast. So let's talk about now we're going to move on from Grim Reaper. So Grim Reaper dissolves and Steve Grimmett moves on. Where does Steve go from here? I know. Let's talk about it. Was Lion's Heart. That was a good time. The, the first incarnation of Lion's Heart had the Hours Twins, bass player and guitarist. Great, great musicians, fantastic musicians, but that's as far as it went. I don't really want to be nasty. It's just that they, I couldn't get them out of their bedroom. They were bedroom players and that's the way they'll stay. But fantastic songwriters 
And yeah, that's really all I can say about that. There, there were reincarnations of uh, Lion's Heart, and every album was special to me. They were really cool. And it was basically Lion's Heart was formed around, not formed around, but I wanted to do blues based British rock, like White Snake type stuff. And yeah, and it was good. Didn't quite make the White Snake stuff, but it was great. I dug the edge of it. I'm a big White Snake fan too, but I dug the edge of the Lion's Heart stuff. So is with Lionheart, is that when you first started playing with Ian then? Yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Ian Nash is when name. he joined the band. Yeah. Actually, before Lion's Heart, there was a Yeah, before Lion's Heart, there was Onslaught. I didn't know if that was before or after that. No, that okay. was before. I got a phone call because Grim Reaper had, had, you know, all but gone. And I got a phone call from their management. We want you to sing on the album, possibly. And I was like, right, okay. So I got them to send me stuff. And it was like, oh, this, I don't know whether this will suit my voice or whatever. And then I spoke to the band and they said, well, look, you know, what we want is for you to sing what you sing over our stuff. I was like, oh, okay. So... I did four tracks on a four-track machine, a, a tape machine, mind, cassette machine, in my dad's garage. And I sent it to them. And Steve Grice, who I remain big friends with and still am, the drummer, he said, we all got in my car. He said, we plugged this thing in. We were like, what the hell is this? <laughs> in a good right, way. Right. And so I ended up then being whisked to oh, – first off, I got whisked to – the record label to see the the A and R guy, and he said, "Can you do this job? Can you do this?" And I was like, "Well, you obviously haven't done your homework. You don't know who I am, do you?" And that, not that I ever say that, but it's just like, "Yes, of course, I'm going to do a good job. I wouldn't put myself through it if I didn't think I was going to do it anyway." We did, and they whisked me off to America because the producer was over there, Stephen Galfas. And we got for two weeks the whole of Atlantic Studios in New York because he was doing two bands. There was two studios. On the third one, we were doing my redoing all the vocals um, uh, for, for Onslaught. And Stefan and I got on really well. And I used to give him so much <laughs> shit, if I can say that. And you'd see the crew, you'd see the, the engineers and everything going, oh, no, I don't believe he's just said that to him. And I'd start, I'd, he'd start on me, basically, and then I'd say, you're just a colonial. Why don't you just grow up? Or I'll take you in the car park and sort you out, you know, all that sort of shit. And Dave, the, I can't remember his surname now, but he was uh, quite a big A&R guy back in the day. He signed um, the Sex Pistols to EMI, although that was a successful relationship. But anyway, um, he caught me doing, me and Stefan doing this. He came out of the elevator and heard me and Galfus going at it. You colonial, I'll take you in the car park and I'll smack, and I'll kick your ass all around. And of course, he saw Stefan later on. He said, Steve's a bit confrontational, isn't he? <laughs> He's like, oh, Dave, you just don't get it. <laughs> That's how we roll. <laughs> yep, <okay. laughs> so, yeah, and that was a good time. It was a tough job for me to do, but I did it. Say so that didn't last for very long. Um, I never thought it would do, really. because It was a stepping stone for me because with Grim Reaper, I hadn't played in Europe or done a few shows in my own country, but not big ones. That was a, a stepping stone for me, but a good one. And I ended up with good friends from that as well. Then the Lion's Heart thing. And basically, that was I got forced into doing that. I wasn't going to, but I got forced into doing it. But I'm glad I did because I really enjoyed it. It was it's good recording time it was great it was really good and we recorded that first album when there was still money being poured into albums so we did it in a see old getting on we did that at uh, ridge farm and yeah you know, we stayed there so it was good good did time you wind up touring japan with lion's heart then yeah i did do that that was really yeah, weird I bet it was because we were out there when it was Day it was released, I think, and then two days later we would do a video for the song. That was for um, Can't Believe, and the A and R guy picked me up in the morning to go and do interviews and stuff. And he said, "Steve, if you do fifteen thousand copies in this country 
it's considered a real big success. I was like, great, that's, that'd be great if we do that. Da, 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 da. And then he said, well, we did that in the first hour and a half this oh morning. My goodness. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I can't remember what albums we sold, but we ended up going straight to number one in the Japanese charts, which is unheard of for a non-Japanese band. And it confined me to my hotel room, basically, because I couldn't walk out in the streets, get mobbed. Wow. <laughs> it was unbelievable, but great. And the first show we did out there was in Tokyo. I can't remember how, many, how big the audience was, but it really knocked me for six. I couldn't remember any of the lyrics. I couldn't remember whatever. And, and I'd got people writing the lyrics down for me so I could put them on. And I didn't need them anyway, but I mean, I got out there and they all renew the lyrics for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Absolutely something else. Yeah. I got a special place in my heart for the Japanese. They're great. I can't wait to take Grim Reaper out there, actually. Well, okay. So then we move from Lionsheart, which again is, is ironic because I knew that band before I knew you. But now we move on. So where do we go from Lionsheart? Because you had a bit of a hiatus for a little while, I know. But I'm not sure when that happened. I know you were doing some things with like some compilation CDs and things like that. Yeah, I was about to give up really because I pretty much had enough and every door I knocked seemed to close and all that sort of thing. And I thought, oh, why should I bother? Anyway, then this guy phones me. I'm doing some songs. I'm doing some tribute album. He said, no, I'd like you to sing on them. And I said, OK, fine. So I went down there and did the first one, and it was great. It was so awesome, actually. Then I kept getting phone call after phone call. Can you come down? Can you come down? And I was doing more and more and more. And then we did stuff like uh, Sharp Dressed Man. Well, we did, the album uh, was... ZZ Top Tribute, right? Yeah, ZZ Top. We did White Snake. We did uh, Two, Iron Maidens, and uh, Thin Lizzy. And the Thin Lizzy was a, a real special day because I got there, and uh, Paul Diano was oh. there. He was doing stuff as well. And uh, I tell you what, I'd never, ever had such a laugh all day in the studio <laughs> with him. And he's what we call a barrow boy, a barrow. Barrows in London he used to have a shop in a barrow that you used to wheel to the place where you stopped and sold your wares. And they were always funny. They were always mouthy, sh- and that's what he was. And he had me entertained for the whole day, I swear. He's such a really nice guy, a great guy, actually. Those little things that happen to you every so often, where you have a you know, really great time. But, yeah, so I did that, and interest started up again. It all ended up a bit funny, really, because I'd started a band called Seven with Ian, and although we didn't release anything, we were like, right, okay, let's, let's. This guy got in touch with me and said, Would you like to do Wacken? I said, Yeah, absolutely. So he said, to, Yeah, it's, uh, they, they want Grim Reaper. And I said, Well, look, it's not going to be Grim Reaper because we a new band, da 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 da, and we'll do some Reaper songs. So did that. And I wanted to do it under the name Seven, and we didn't. When we got there, they were still expecting Grim Reaper. So this guy had really screwed us over. So we couldn't do it because we'd only rehearsed like four Reaper songs. So anyway, we did the set. And uh, yeah, and things started looking up from there. I'd, I'd be getting in, people getting in touch with me to do one off festivals and stuff like that, weekend warrior type stuff. And that's how it all started. And I was like, we can tour this. I think we can tour this. So we all sat down and had a chat about it. Yeah, everybody was up for it. And so then we thought, well, we'll give Nick the opportunity. Um, So we called him, he and I called him, and we were just like, look, man, we're going to be doing this. We're giving the opportunity to join. He did a long story, but he didn't really want to, to do it. I don't think he could at the time because he was working for Marshall. So he he got a job. So, yeah, we fired up and I had to, Nick and I came to agreement, it couldn't be Grim Reaper, it would be Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper. So he was happy. And I get an email every so often, oh, somebody's saying it's Grim Reaper. And, and I have to get in touch with the promoter and say, look, you've got to advertise it as Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper. You've been asked to do that. 
because then Nick was getting phone calls. Oh, are you going to be playing? Are you going to be doing this? No, I'm not. But Nick does join us every so often. He'll come out and do a show with us or two shows. And he's uh, he flew over to oh Sweden, Sweden Rock. And he said, I'm coming over. Can I come and play? Yeah, OK, sure. So, yeah, he did that with us. And that was another time. It was the first time we played together. Was it at Reggie? You see, that one, you came to that. So, yeah, and that was a real special because I hadn't seen Nick for 20 odd years. And it's like, oh, what? Because we used to be as thick as thieves. We were terrible. Well, and it's interesting because in the interim of this, I would run into Nick because of what I do for a living. I would run into Nick kind of on a regular basis out there doing things. But, you know, we'd never talk anything to do with Grim Reaper because he knew I was really good friends with you and I didn't want to have anything to do with what was going on with you and him or anything like that. And it was all good. It's just that isn't what we would talk about. So it was interesting when the COVID hit and everybody's sitting at home going stir crazy. And I thought, well, it'd be kind of fun to start doing some collaborations with people, just get people doing stuff, get friends together. And obviously I would play with you so much more if I lived in the same country as so this was an opportunity to start doing things. And so that's when Heaven and Hell came up to do with you and Nick on video. And it was a lot of fun. It is fun. No two ways about it. And then when I get an idea for a song and I get in touch with you, what about this one? What about, it? oh yeah, that'd be great. Yep. Well, just so you know, I don't know when this podcast will go up, but I'm waiting on stuff from you. And then there's another one of yours. I'm waiting on some other people, the White Snake one. So they're all being done. They're just in different phases of being done. Yeah, yeah. The, the White Snake one, I'm going to re-record the video for that because I recorded it vertical. So I'll redo that one. Yeah, that's not an issue. Yeah, I love doing it. And I thought, wouldn't that be great if we got sort of nine or ten songs together and, and actually released it and then went and did a quick tour? <laughs> I think you're not the first person that's thought of that. I thought that would be a pretty fun thing too. Actually, Joel and I were talking about that. Oh, you too. That. Great. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. That would be really cool. Yeah. I shouldn't think there are too many people that don't know about the stuff. That yeah, that's do. right. That's the thing is, is nowadays, which I was going to talk to you a little bit about your thoughts on what little is left of the music business. But that's the thing is, is like you, I've always been blessed to be able to play with people that I enjoy being around. I've never played in a band where it was like a job and I was just miserable being around these people. So it seems like now in the music business, that's the whole thing is, is that you got to love what you're doing and you got to love who you're doing it with because you sure aren't doing it for the paycheck. No, it's, it's difficult to make money anyway, but now the COVID thing's happened. I should imagine it's going to be much more difficult. When I had a South American tour sorted for October of this year, but I've had to cancel it because most of the countries in South America are on Great Britain's red list which means you can't go there and come back without having to isolate in a hotel that they provide and you've got to pay for it. You know, probably cost in a region of about £3,000 altogether with all your lost wages and, and having to pay for this hotel and stuff. So it's just not viable where we had to cancel that, which was a pain. But it's always there again. And then looking at states, I was going to come out there maybe March of next year, but I think I'm going to put it way, way back to October of 2022, just to see. Yeah, there's a lot of bands here in the States that are starting to go out and get their feet right, but they're doing very short tours and shows, 15 shows, calling it a day. See, financially, that's just not, I couldn't do that. I've got to come out for at least two months for it to financially work because the first thing we have to get before we can really start booking is a visa. And that's four grand, four thousand pounds before we even start. And then there's all the flights and all the rest of it. So it's just like it's not financially viable. Well, and then the COVID hassle. I can't imagine how hard it is for you to try and come from England over here. I don't know how the COVID stuff is for you leaving your country and leaving my country is not a problem. It's coming back because even the state that all the, the flight corridors between the states and the UK are closed, so I can't even come out there that's a, it's a real pain in the backside at the moment but it will get better because we will beat this thing no i agree i sweetwater gear fest i normally do some speaking at gear fest we're doing everything online this year 
summer NAM is open, but all my endorsements and stuff, nobody's going. Everybody's waiting until winter. So hopefully winter 2022, hopefully you can make it over. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to actually, I'd like to do yeah, that. It'd be fun to, to hang out and go do some schmoozing. Anyway, well, we've been on here a long time. I'll let you go, but I thought it would be fun. I have these podcasts that I'm doing and I thought, why in the hell have I not done something with you yet? So here we yeah. are. Cool. Anytime, my I appreciate brother. that, buddy. Okay, well, thank you, Steve, for your time. Say hi to Millie and the rest of the family for me. I will. And we'll talk soon. And everybody else out there, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Please, please go out there and support Steve. Let's talk about that quick. Where's a good place for people to go to check out your CDs, anything that you've got available like that? We normally have a website up and running, but actually at the moment we've taken it down because things stopped working on it. So I've got somebody now working on it to totally update it and everything. But you can still see I'm on Facebook every day on Steve Grimmett's official and Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram. Everywhere the media is, I'm on there. So you can get in touch with me there and do whatever. Most people do. <laughs> that's awesome. They keep me busy. <laughs> yeah, I know what that's like, man. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, buddy. And we'll talk again soon, okay? Okay, buddy. Give my love to your family. Will. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll talk to you soon, okay? If you enjoyed today's podcast and want to learn guitar even faster, go to guitarzoom.com and click the Get Started button to get access to courses that are right for your interest and skill level. Again, go to guitarzoom.com and click the Get Started button.